So tonight we're talking about remittances, which fell by 10 billion dollars in 2023 and for our viewers let me just give you some context remittances make up a large chunk of jamaica's gdp so the money that th those of you abroad watching right now the money that you send back home is very important to jamaica's entire economy so seeing it fall by 10 billion dollars david how significant is that and what caused it so to put things into context kalila uh when you say ten billion dollars, that's Jamaican dollars. So, for the viewers who don't know, the Bank of Jamaica publishes the remittance data on a monthly on a monthly basis, and they recently published their 2023 uh, summary of the remittance market. And what you would have seen was a seventy million dollar decline in the total remittance inflows into the country. So. Whereas in 2022, there would have been 3.44 billion US dollars. This year, we only had about 3.37 billion dollars US coming in as remittances. And that decline can easily be attributed to, you know, just persons do have as much to send down, you know? Because when you check it to Kalila, 2019 remittances would have just been at around 2.0. 2.9, 2.4 billion dollars US. So we effectively grown that amount by around 40, 45 percent since 2019, which is influenced by inflation. But for instance, it's just a bit this robust. It does speak volumes because what it does is that it actually gives credence to other potential players to enter the market. So what do we mean by that? And let me just go back to the beginning for persons to understand. Remittances in normal circumstances, really, the funds that friends, relatives, whoever sends home through, you know, like a Western Union, a MoneyGram, a Remitly, Boss Revolution, like those are some of the examples. Some persons, you know, will go to a physical outlet to collect their cash in Jamaican dollars. Some persons will collect it straight to the bank account, but that's what remittance in a simple sense is. And what we'd have seen last year, or in the last two years, is we'd have seen TFOB 2021 Limited, which is the operators of Link, join the free, you know, to become a primary agent, meaning that they can have sub-agents, in a sense, to process remittances across the country, but they're really digital. And then we also saw Supreme Ventures in a remittance subsidiary, I believe it's SPL FinTech, get approved last year by the BOJ a primary agent license. So right now there are nine primary agents, you know, still dominated by Western Union on the great screen, the Money Services Limited. But the fact that you're seeing more players enter the space and the context of 2019 around $2.41 billion versus $3.37 billion this year, and only seeing a 2% decline in total inflows. So all those 10 billion Jamaican dollars reduction or 70 million US dollars, you're talking about only a 2% decline relative to over an over 3.44 billion US dollar, you know, inflow by 2023. So all this is saying is that persons can probably have a little bit hard in Jamaica. I mean, it's, I mean it's everything that's going on, and you potentially might have the case whereby some persons are earning more overseas from the US and have the money sent to Jamaica. So all of this just speaks great, you know, for you know, like a lack of financial services. Alliance on a Strategic Queer Group, Western Union under Grace Kennedy, you know, on one hand, or decline, 2% decline would have been an outlier compared to the other Latin American markets like your Guatemala, your Mexico, and right. El Salvador, which we should have seen, you know, remittances grow 7-9%. Right. So, so that's, that's what I was wondering, because I, I looked at the report and I said, well, this is strange, because if it is that people just are doing worse off in general over in the UK and the US, how come remittances to Latin Amer other Latin American countries <laughs> increased? But Jamaica... Those guys work, Kalila. Those guys work. Like, <laughs> remittances make up a significant inflow for you know, Mexico and other countries. And well, Jamaica too, it rivals the income from tourism. <laughs> no, I agree. But the reality is it's 
a lot harder for some persons as well. As much as you know, you could say, hey, grandma, auntie, I need some help. They also need help for themselves. And we shouldn't forget that, you know, there are different dynamics happening in the background as well, because El Salvador, you know, as President Nayib Bukele would describe, is the safest country in the Western Hemisphere. So, you know, you're seeing a number of persons return and carrying wealth back to the country. So that's also a factor that we should consider when it comes down to El Salvador in particular. That is so interesting because, what, five years ago, El Salvador was one of the most violent countries in the world. Kalila, in 2016, it's they had crazy probably... crazy to see what they did with crime. They probably had 88 or 100 murders per 100,000 citizens in their country. The highest murder rate in the world. Not, higher than Jamaica, number. guys. High, much higher than Jamaica. <laughs> They're actually the lowest now in the entire Western Hemisphere, like about 2.8 or 3 persons per 100,000 citizens getting murdered now. And if it's you're wondering sad, but... how they do it, if, and if the viewers are wondering how they did it, they basically rounded up all the alleged, <laughs> anybody they suspected was a gang member, they rounded them all up and put them in jail. All of them. Well, it worked. <laughs> people, are, people are happy. And the thing is, even Price Smart, Price Smart, you know, uh, they opened just, you know, one location in Jamaica, which should have been Portmore, right? Which should have come about, what, 20 years post the first opening in Jamaica. El Salvador only had two personal locations, you know, before Bekele stepped in. And they opened, it, they opened one location last September. And they opened another one this month, actually, in Santa Ana, El Salvador. So the fact that you're even seeing price merits willing to double their footprint in El Salvador does speak volumes. And Amazing. I believe even... But if we, if we try that here in Jamaica, they're going to say rights, human rights. It became a to, crime to be a member of a gang. And if they suspected the, you... You couldn't wear a tattoo of a, a, tattoo of a, of a gang in your face? Your tattoos on your face? Like, mm -hmm. or your body? The gang tattoos? Yeah. That so if you were in the gang did. and you quit, but you still had the tattoos? Jail. The assault. And you but know the what would is, happen here if they tried that in Jamaica, right? All the human but rights. But that's like, El Salvador's Jamaica is a little bit different. In the case of Mexico, you know, they're, they're always pushing their ground. And I would still probably need to go back and look at the dynamics of their market. It's a little bit more appreciation as to, you know, what did that lead to that further surge or limitations to that market. Because I pointed out El Salvador has a different economic makeup occurring under new leadership and you know mexico is one of the highest remittance inflow markets in the world i doubt if it's a statistic on my, on my hand right now so i won't say they're the largest but they are one of the largest in the world so you have your indonesia slash malaysia you have your mexico you have probably like, like a egypt these you know diaspora communities really support their families back home so we should not, you know, neglect the value remittances and also where intermediaries like uh, SBL, uh, TFOB, uh, Alliance, Alaska, you know, come in to somewhat bridge that gap or make some income off of it because we've even seen where, you know, GK, our great candidate, you know, introduced their GK1 mobile app and Visa debit card. You would have seen Jimmy Money Transfer promoting the launch of its prepaid Visa debit card. So, you know, and Lasco Financial would have launched a Lasco Gold card. So you're, so with all of this remittance inflows in a sense, even with that relative decline last year, you're still seeing remittances more move more digital. Still a far away from the real situation of the population, but you're still seeing more and more companies move towards that digitization of remittances and trying to connect or tap into that commerce space that doesn't exist. Because when you transact with cash, there are no fees. When you transact with a card, there's a minor fee, even if small, it does add up. So D has a point. D says, is it possible we just may not be as dependent on overseas relatives for money? Higher rate of employment? Boy, mm. that is one that is one suggestion, but the reality is it's still tough for other people. We shouldn't forget that, you know. We would have seen the cost of transportation go up around late October last year. We would have seen, well, minimum wage would have gone up, which would have been good for some people. 
with other purses, you know, still pretty tough. Same thing, same point being made. <laughs> yeah, but that's an interesting that, take, though. Well, the Probably reality is, something. the reality in the day is Jamaica having relative full employment. Can no country will ever have total, you know, unemployment going to zero because persons are always changing roles or jobs and it's a state of play. But realistically speaking, Jamaica does have, you know, a low unemployment rate. You know, not sure to an extent, you know, how the microeconomics on the ground are, but at the end of the day, remittance figures does speak, you know, a lot of volumes about the support that's coming into the economy. And on the other hand, it also can be indicative signal of persons seeking to send funds back to Jamaica to build or, you know, grow on different things that they want to do, probably investments, real estate or so on. So that's just one arbitrary example. Hmm. Very interesting. A lot of other interesting things happened this week. So we had local government elections yesterday. <laughs> oh, no, we don't know who win. <laughs> hey, both, both of them claim Nikalila. Just oh think, my think, think, think like Donald Trump. They both won. That is what matters. They both won. <laughs> Jamaica won. We all won. Why is that they both won? They both claim victory. <laughs> Hey, they both came victory. I'm not going to be the guy who tries to check the fact check them. I'm just going to go with what they say. They both mm. won. No, well, I ask you why I said that because there is a perception that, well, yes, they both claimed victory, but regardless of who won, well, we had one, we had a fairly peaceful <laughs> election, and then two, PNP definitely gaining ground. So even if they didn't win overall, when the final tally is counted, they've gained ground. And so, so there is that to consider. What direction is the country going in? Because usually we use local government as a litmus test towards general elections. But I don't uh, know how somebody... deep you are into the politics. I used to be deep, deep into politics. And I was at... That was, you were in news. You yeah. were in news. You had to cover it. No, someone pointed it out that, you know, you're not likely going to see national overall elections being kept until probably close to September 2025, which is when you're constitutionally due. And at the same time, <laughs> it was an interesting, you know, a moment because while it would have been relatively lower than 2016 local government election on a percentage basis, you still saw the fact that a lot of these divisions were decided on literally 100 votes, 20, 50 votes. So vote apathy is very real, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, these slim margins do show that it's going to be a very tight and tough, you know, battle come next year when national elections are actually held. And that's going to be interesting because if you've actually followed, for example, a Semex or one of these publicly listed US companies, they actually list the transition or changing governments as part of their risks or events that occurred in the year. So a lot of companies are going to be watching, you know, not just locally, but internationally going to be watching, you know, what happened here in the local government elections and, you know, making predictions and potential measures based on what they expect for 2025. So we shouldn't neglect the reality that politics plays because at the end of the day, either way or whoever wins the government control, we still as citizens have to redo the reality of the governance that does come out of your situations. I see a couple other theories in the chat about the reason for remittances dipping. Lanesra says maybe a lot more Latin Americans crossing Mexico border and sending money back. Philip even says, then, <laughs> Philip says perhaps more Jamaicans are traveling with their money because there's more interest by diasporans in investing in Jamaica. Phil actually has a very good point because <clears throat> I recall Grace Kennedy, and I think probably it was really Grace Kennedy to be honest, and I think Western Union and MoneyGrams reports highlighted that. When COVID happened, what would have occurred would have been a situation where because persons couldn't carry the physical cash down with them on their trips, 
they had to use these different channels that should have been remitted to agencies to send money back home. So, you know, the remittance companies have benefited tremendously from, you know, those scenarios. But in the grand scheme of things, I don't, I'm not sure if $70 million really came through everybody's pockets at the airport. <laughs> like, that's a lot of money. But it's a very relevant point, though, still, because if that money is being carried directly in pocket, you know, as cash, that won't necessarily be captured as easily on the remittance data. So that actually is a very valid point. Mm, all right. Well, thank you so much this evening, David. Something for us to consider. A You're lot. welcome, Galila. <laughs> Let us see how tomorrow goes by. The, and tomorrow, Thursday, because that's when most public data companies in the JSCs, all their financials are going to be due. So mm. Thursday is going to be a melee of reports. Your Grace okay. Kennedy, your JSC, your uh, Pan Jamaica, Sadiqa Group. Just look out for fast and fierce reports come Thursday, people. All right. Going to keep an eye out. Thanks for the heads up, David. Always appreciated.